it is. You want to pray for your success. But the Talmud says, uh, says that, and this is, this is really crazy, but it says you don't even want to have somebody punished for you when they deserve it. You don't want it to come through you. Let Hashem take care of it. You don't want it to be through you. Because even when it, when it happens, if you're the cause of someone else getting punished, it could have bad repercussions on the person. You don't really want it. You want to stay away from being the cause of anyone being punished. And that's why we say, I, 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 hey, Hashem, you know, deal with my, don't punish them because of me. Because, because, because there is a spiritual rule that if you go and you, and you actually are, then there's a negative consequence you cause to somebody else, and you, even though you have a right, you have a claim for it, but it could come back to get you. But that's counterintuitive to all the wars that we fought, I mean. Why? You, because by fighting a war, you're punishing another human being. Are you sorry? Well, first of all, I'm, ta I'm, ta I'm talking about, about Jew, 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 Jew to a Jew also. Okay. Right. I'm talking about a Jew to a Jew. I mean, you know, war, war is a different story here. Um, but generally, you should not go and be the cause of someone else's. And you don't want to do that. You, like, you know, I, I, I actually think about that. There was a case that I did something where I think I was right. It was a very hard situation. I basically kind of had to... Uh, um, move somebody out of the position that they were in. And I think I did the right thing. I th the time I was sure I was doing the right thing. But I think that I got, I got whacked because I did it. <laughs> and even though I think I may have been right, but it didn't matter. It just You don't want to be the cause of someone else's is hurt. So you don't want to call someone, and by the way, if you, if you are hurt by someone and you do call out to Hashem, that's when you get immediate response. There is a response. So someone who is was called there's an onat varim. There's a oppression of a person. When the person is oppressed and they call out to God to get that person, there is an effect. So you wanna you wanna be careful about it. So you're not supposed to do that either. I mean, you want to, you can. I, if I would, I would to recommend to you the best thing to do is call out to to have yourself saved, and let this person stop harassing you, and let the thing you know be better. But not to like let this guy be smashed. That, that's that's not really a Jewish way to go about things. Now again, I'm not talking about ISIS. I'm talking about let's say you know with, you know, <laughs> with fellow that they should be wiped out. I'm not talking about the, 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 the fellow Jews and stuff like that. You know, and that's the famous thing. You don't want to pray for someone to die. You want to pray for them to to, to, to change. All right. So Sarah was angry. Sarah was angry. One thing she was angry about was that. Avram didn't defend her. The thing that she was angry about was that she said, Avram, when you prayed, you prayed that God should give you a kid. You didn't say the word us. Now you got what you wished. You got your kid. But you didn't have it to us because you didn't say specifically us. She has a claim on Avram because she, he wasn't specific in saying with me and Sarah. And Sarah saw that as, 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 as uh, Hagar got pregnant right away and Avram's prayer worked. You know, but his prayer worked because he didn't pray for them. So what's the, what's this, the, what's the, the, the import of this whole thing? Is it a good idea, a bad idea? So let's go through a few things. Because the words say, if I do the merit of giving this other woman, I'm going to be able to build it myself. I think there's two ways to understand this. One way is, is the principle that if somebody raises a child, adoption, it's Consider like they gave birth to that child. Okay? So one way is you could say, this is kind of what Danny was saying before a little bit, that, that so, Sarah would raise the child that was born through Hagar, which was her plan because she was the Tzedekist and she knew more than, than, than Hagar. Hagar was learning from Sarah. So then if she raises the child, then she's like giving birth to the child. But I would add that I believe that would even potentially give her a merit to have a child herself because she now raised a child into the world. She adopted a child. She created a soul being brought into this world and that was because of her and she like, gave birth to that child so God will say, okay, you have this merit and maybe she'll have the merit to have another child through her, her own child. That's one explanation. The other place is a little bit harder but I believe this is true because you see this. I think that when Sarah is saying, I think Rachel is saying it, I think Chana is saying it also, is that if I bring this woman in for the goal of having a child being brought into the world, 
right, through Avram or through Elkanah here, that is putting myself in a hard situation for a greater good. And that's a tremendous merit. I mean, you you, you kind of like hold back your own emotion and, and sort of get feeling in a, in a negative situation for a greater good. That, I think, is the tremendous merit that they're talking about. Because that's why this whole idea is so difficult. But Sarah is saying, and, and, and Khan is saying, that listen, I'm going to build through this by me doing this difficult thing of taking another woman and saying, marry her because I can't have kids. That itself, God will look down upon me and help me because of that. And that's really true. And, you know, it's like... There's a, there's a statement, I don't want to say the name of the rabbi, because I, I, I could have the name of the rabbi wrong, but it, it, the name of the rabbi is probably one of, the, one of the greatest in history. One of the greatest in history. A name that everyone knows. And I believe it was him that said that one of the happiest days in his life was he was on a boat, and someone urinated on him. Hmm? Yay! Yeah! <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, what a happy day! <laughs> it's raining! Uh, yeah, yeah. Why was it the happiest day? Because he said that what happened was there is a, a, a part in a person that we want to think how important we are. And all of a sudden, he, this great, great rabbi who had the potential danger of falling to the problem, said, hmm, I'm the most blessed, I'm the most important person in the world. But he, he was. He was the most important person in the world at that time. He was. Literally was. There was no more important than this rabbi in the entire world at that time. And for many generations after that, too. And yet, he had the humility now because he was denigrated in like the lowest way. Now, again, I want to be careful here. I'm not telling you to denigrate yourself. But the story of Chana is, are you willing to do what's the greater good even when it's difficult for you. That's the merit. Okay? So she humbled her, herself. Humbled herself. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring a child to this world. And through me giving Penina now to my husband, maybe God will have, you know, compassion on me and I'll have a child. Okay? So it's be, so that's what she did. But I, I want to just, because we're trying to study Chana, that's an incredible, incredible view. And I, I know Sari did it, but this is what Chana is doing according to the al now also, which changes the dynamic. Now, Panina starts having kids. Panina has ten kids. Okay? And she keeps sticking it to Chana. Every time. Every time. Did you bring your bib? She's sticking it to her. Okay? And we said Panina was sticking it to her. Why? Because she was had good intention. She wanted her to pray. But like, okay? Yeah. <laughs> no, it is okay. no. <laughs> So, uh, uh, so, uh, some people said last week, and I saw actually people say as clearly that there was mixed intentions. That was one of the, we probably explained the two answers why Pina would see this was going to get punished. We, we said two answers last week, and, and, and they're both correct. One is that she did it too harshly, even though it was good intention. Teach you the means, don't justify the ends, you got to be sensitive about the means too. But the second reason I saw someone else bring down, we mentioned later last week also, was that there was mixed emotions. On one hand, there was the actual L'shem Shemaim. She wanted, she wanted Chana, and Chana was going to broaden the relationship. She wanted her to call out and, and, and pray to God. There was another part of her that was, like, jealous. And so she also stuck it to her from that point of view, and that's why she's punished. Mm -hmm. We're going to see. What's that? What oh, we're going to see it. We're going to see it today. All right, so good. Very good. Okay, so that's where we're up to. We're up to now. Chana goes, and because of Penina's... What page? What well, page? 418. No, I'm sorry, 420. 420, 421. So, after this whole story, when Penina is pushing and, 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 and jolting and aggravating Chana, she goes and she cries and screams out in the tabernacle in Shiloh, and the, uh, the elder, the, the, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, Ellie, thinks she's drunk. She smashes back to him, you don't have this right. You misunderstand. We talked about that last week. You misunderstand this whole thing. I'm not drunk. I am a woman that is uh, in pain. 
And we talked about one of some of the reasons. We said Rashi thinks that she's moving her lips and she's not doing it out loud, which was the way they used to pray in the past, is pray out loud. She's just moving her lips. We're going to explain a little later some more ideas from this. But she's going to move her lips, and she goes for a very long time. So she's in, in pain, but it's a very long time. And Ellie thinks of something funny here. I think she's drunk. She tells him, I'm not drunk. And why did you why did you accuse me of such a thing? Why do you think that I would do such a thing? I'd come to the temple drunk. What do you think I am? Okay? And Ellie now says to her in um, verse, there's no verse there, page 421, third line down. Ellie answered and said, Go to peace. The God of Israel will grant the request you have made of him. Ellie gives her a bracha. I heard the last week I said that's why the kids have the thing. If you accuse someone of doing something they don't know that they didn't do, you have to give them a bracha afterwards. Ellie gives her a bracha. I accuse you wrongly, and you're a righteous woman. Shem should give you your, your, your request. Now, she said, May your maid servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her on her way. She ate, and she no longer had the same look on her face. This is incredible, because really, you, you know how miserable she was, and now all of a sudden he says that to her and she's like, they have never look depressed anymore. What does that mean to us? That she has faith that it's going to happen. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's what's called a munis She trusts the, the Torah sages. And now Ellie tells her this is going to happen. She's confident. And she goes about her business in a whole new way. Her whole life's changed. Just in the brach of Ellie, nothing's happened yet. But she feels like, I'm good. They rose early in the morning, prostrated themselves before Hashem. She, they, they, they pray. Some commentaries say because she's so confident it's going to happen. They, they prostrated themselves as if in thanks. Then they returned and came to their home to Ramah. Elkanah kind of knew his wife, Hannah's wife, and Hashem remembered her. And it was with the passing of the period of days that Hannah had conceived and given birth to a son. She named him Shmuel, for he said, I requested him from Hashem. Okay? Shmuel, he's Shaul, he's asked, May El, from God. Okay? She calls him that. Now, something very interesting here. Um, Chana says, if you look back here, um, look back on page 419 a second. From the line in the English, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 lines from the top. And sort of the end of the third paragraph. You made servant and give him a male offspring, then I shall give him to Hashem. You see it there? All the days of his life, and a razor shall not come upon his head. She promises Hashem if she gets the child, he's going to be a Nazar Olam. He is going to be a Nazarite his whole life. He'll never cut his hair. And he will, she will give him to God all the days of her, his life. And we're going to see she's going to bring him, at, as, after she finishes weaning him, when he's a little kid still, she brings him to the temple. The town, and she's going to leave him there. Now the, cra the craziest part about it is she didn't really tell us to her husband. She kind of let that out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How did she stand through for yeah, incredible. But that, that's part of the greatness here. It's because she really, she's, she's saying to Hashem, listen, it's natural that a person wants a kid for their own, you know, things. But she's got a different goal. Her goal is, again, we understand there's a natural, normal emotion that a person wants their kids to play with them, whatever they want to do. And but, but, but when we talk about the idea of, of tzar gidl wanim, of the, of the trouble of raising kids, this and that, the sages tell us it's to raise them in Torah. Not just to raise them. It's to, it's to raise them that they become spiritual beings. You know, it's not, it's not enough just to have a child and say, okay, so, you know, as long as they're happy. It's, that's not what we're shooting for. I know it's what the world's shooting for, but it's not what we're shooting for. We're shooting for the idea of, 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 of giving birth to a child, raising a child that, that is going to be a spiritual, uh, righteous person. And so that, that's, that's, that, that she, she exemplifies that. She's willing to give her son up to Hashem. So that's, that's an, I agree, it's difficult. 
But that's her, that's her objective here because she's thinking, I, wa I want to do the greatest thing in the world. And Shmuel, by the way, he becomes the greatest. Shmuel's compared to Moshe and to Aaron. Okay? The, the, the verse in Psalms says, he equals Moshe and Aaron. He is the beginning of this whole prophetic period time right now. She's a prophetess. Her husband's a prophet, too. Elkanah's a prophet, and she's a prophetess, Khan. We'll see in a little bit. But really what happens is, Shmuel becomes a whole new level prophet. He's the one who really starts teaching and training people to become prophets. From the point of Shmuel is when we enter the stage of what's called the prophets, moving from the elders to the prophets, because Shmuel makes prophecy a, a more available thing. It wasn't that available before. It was very, it was very scarce. But Shmuel's training prophets. There's prophecy schools. I mean, I told you before, it's amazing. There were schools where people went to learn to become a prophet. Kind of like a Harry Potter. I was just thinking. Yeah. <laughs> kind, of, kind of, but not exactly. But there was, and that and that would be the ultimate case of a person with a prophecy school, where his mother would say, "You gonna make a living from this?" <laughs> that, 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 that one you're gonna hear. You know, it's bad enough of your liberal arts <laughs> prophecy. A doctor that doesn't work. With yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, but there was, and and we talked about it. There, there could, and but. It was possible a person go to prophecy school their whole lives and never get prophecy. Mm -hmm. Now, how many prophets were there in the Jewish people? It says there were over 1,200,000 prophets in the Jewish wow. people. Over 600,000 male, 600,000 female. Now, we don't have those recorded. Why are they not recorded? Because only the, only the prophecies that were relevant for future generations are recorded. Prophecies, you had an individual prophecy. God's going to show you where your donkey is. You know, uh, you don't you don't need to write that down. You know, <laughs> God showed me my donkey was hiding behind the shed. It's like, who cares? You know, or if it was your personal prophecy about your own spiritual growth, that's not relevant for everyone else. That's what a prophet was. He was a, a spiritual person that would be connected. So, so if it wasn't recorded, then how do we know how many there were? Oh, because we have another text that records them. We, the Gemara says clearly we only recorded. We only recorded the, the, the 49 that are recorded. Because they were, their prophecies were determined by the sages to be prophecies that were, that were relevant for future generations. But there's a Midrash that says that the Jewish nation, which was 600,000 leaving Egypt, it has a verse that shows that there were 600,000 both male and female prophets to match the number of Jews, of, of army-aged males that... 10,000 is a special number, how many souls there are. There were that many male and female prophets. prophets. But, by the way, prophecy for females is considered to be easier and a higher level. That's why Sarah, Abraham is told to listen to Sarah because women are generally considered actually have an easier time attaining prophecy. It's a different aspect. We talked about last week about the idea of Talmud. I, I, I think I, I think I got uh, Hillary never will learn Talmud again. You know, successful Gemara. in our Gemara and our, our one Gemara says I think she said, "Oh my gosh, this is what the guys learn all day." Yeah, so that, that's more male concept. The prophecy actually is more linked into the, to a female, a female quality. personal conversation. Yeah, we're now we're just we're talking about. It. So, but because 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 prophecy is the the idea of Talmud. I'm trying to explain why because Talmud is, is is the idea of of the mind which is the um, a certain ag aggressive, uh, um, uh, sort of a proactive system, and prophecy is being a being open and, and being able to receive from God. So the the Talmud process works better for the men, but women are actually tuned in more to the ability to receive and to be and to be open to receiving, and therefore their their quality of prophecy is greater. Per se, yeah. but. Uh isn't prophecy be God speaking to people? Doesn't he choose who he speaks to? So, okay, so this is very important because anyone who's seen The Matrix, mm -hmm. the first one, when he's sitting there in his room and they come and they say, Neo, you're the one. That's not true. That doesn't happen, okay? It's not like all of a sudden the Mashiach's sitting there and he's playing craps in Vegas and all of a sudden they come and say, you're the one. No, it's not like that. Prophecy is a spiritual ladder that you need to climb to get prophecy. There's a very common book we have right on the shelves on how to get prophecy. 
It's called the Path of the Just by Moshe Chayim Latzato. And he lists the ten levels there, and a person develops these levels, and the last level in the Talmud says that is called Ruach HaKosh, Divine Inspiration. So to become a prophet, you need to become a holy, righteous person. You gotta work on the stuff, and you gotta work on your traits, and you gotta learn to meditate, and you gotta learn to pray, and you gotta learn to think of certain things. But it all has to do with becoming a holy person. So Hashem chooses the person, but you gotta prepare yourself to be on that level. Okay. Let's see. Any, any other questions on what I said so far? Kind of makes sense? Yep. So far. So Hannah now. We see here that she prays to God that this, give me this child, this child is going to be to you forever. Okay? She gets pregnant. She names the child Shmuel because she was, he was asked, Shaul, made from El, from God. Okay? Now, in the end of the, the paragraph there, the uh, last paragraph on 421, the man of Elkanah sent his entire household to bring offerings to Hashem the annual offering, and his vow. But Chana did not ascend. Chana doesn't go up now. Okay, it's time to go up. It's time to go up to the temple again, to, the, to Shiloh, to Tabernacle. Three times a year we go up. Okay, he's going up. And she told her husband, no, I'm not going up. You go up without me. Why? Until the child is weaned. Then I will bring him, who shall appear before Hashem, and he shall settle there forever. Oh, uh, forgot to mention, I took a vow that I will donate him to God forever. <laughs> so now she doesn't want to tell him this because uh, commentary, some of them say that she felt that once she went up with him, she, she'd have to leave him there ready. So now she, she determined that the way her vow went was that she would bring him up when he's ready, and once he's up there, he's up there. So she's going, he's too little now, she's, she's nursing him, she's taking care of him, she's getting a little bit older, but then when I go up, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be the situation he's gonna stay in. Now what else can I respond to that? Could he have annulled her? So he could have annulled her right now if he wanted to. Yeah, yeah. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, do what is good in your eyes. Anna, you know what you can do? You can do it. Remain until you wean him. But may Hashem fulfill his word. You asked for a child that was going to be the spiritual light into the world. That's what she was asking. Zerah ben Anashima, she wanted a person that was, that was going to be a person who was going to be some spiritual leader. So you do what you said. You promised to give him to Hashem, and hopefully Hashem will do what you said through prophecy is going to happen. You're telling me now this, this child you prayed for, this miracle child, is going to be this, this spiritual leader. So you do what you say. If that's what you say, I'll, you can bring him up. And then when you bring him up there, but hopefully God will do what, you, what you're prophesizing, and this child will become who you say he's going to be. Okay, so fine. So now he ascended with her when she weaned him. Three bulls and one at full, a flat, they brought this tribute to Hashem. And Shiloh, the little child was still tender. They slaughtered the bull and they brought the child to Eli. Okay. So now the kid is young, they bring him up to the temple. Now she said, I beg you, my lord, by your life. This is a lot. I, I actually in the Hebrew, because the Hebrew is incredible. It's, even the English, you realize there's something going on. Beg you, Lord, by your life, my lord. I am the woman who is standing with you here to pray to Hashem. For this child did I pray. Hashem granted me my request that I asked of him. Furthermore, I have, I have lent him to Hashem all the days that he will survive. He is lent to Hashem. Then he prostrated himself to Hashem. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of drama in this thing. There's a lot of drama going on. Thank you, my Lord. So, the simple way to read this is like this. The simple way is, is that she comes in and she says, Listen, I, I want to I bring him, but he's a little kid. <laughs> like the high priest wasn't exactly a nursemaid, you know. It's like, you know, I'm bringing my little kid here. You know, hey, I bring my little kid here, and you could, and I'm gonna leave him here. Yeah, right. I'm, you're gonna leave. You know, watch someone's this kid for the rest of their life. I'm going. So, so the simple explanation, which is still pretty dramatic, is that she says to Ellie, "Listen, I know he's young, but I, I want to leave him here, and I want you to raise him." Okay. And he does. And he, teaches, he teaches him the ways of prophecy. 
and very incredible things happen. I mean, to the point where you know Eli doesn't even realize. We're gonna, there's a story later, which we then we learn in this book of Shmuel, where where Shmuel goes to sleep one night and he hears his voice, and he thinks Eli calling him, and he goes he goes in and he says, "Are you calling me?" In the middle of the night. I'm calling you. I'm gonna sleep. He goes back. Here's the voice calling him again. He comes back and says, "Did you call me?" I didn't call you. What's going on? He said, I heard a voice calling me. So then Eli realizes that God is speaking to him. And at a young age, Shmuel is being called. So Eli tells him what to respond to God, you know. And, and, and he responds, and he gets his first prophecy. And it's a very heavy prophecy. It's a prophecy that has to do with Eli and Eli's future and this and that. But Eli is training Shmuel, and he's going to teach him the ways of prophecy, and he's going to become this great person. Now, so the first simple explanation is Han is begging him and saying, listen, I want you to take him. And he's saying to him, listen, this kid is the miracle child. I'm the same woman. I'm the woman. I'm the same as I was before. It doesn't change to me. I had this child miraculously. Do your prayer. Remember what happened? So this child is going to be something special because he was born in this miraculous way through the, through the prayer and through your blessing. And Ellie, and Ellie agrees to it. Okay? All right. Questions, comments, thoughts, what we said so far? Kind of makes sense, sort of makes sense, a little makes sense. Give me a Does she have any more children afterwards? Ah. So we're going we're gonna to see in a second. She's going to have five kids. Let me see, we'll see that in one second. Oh, I don't know that. Any other, any other questions, thoughts, ideas? Do we know how old he is? I'm thinking three? Yeah. He's yeah. Yeah. <coughs> very young. If I hear voices at night, I should come to you? Uh, you yeah, and uh, I have some medication. I can <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hearing voices today is not, not what it used to be. <laughs> okay. Now, so, very good. Now, that's the basic storyline. Now, now, I want to tell you one other thing. This, this is a fascinating other way that the story goes on here. This, this is a, it's a fantastic Gemara I just want to share with you. The Gemara, the Talmud reads this in a different way also. The Talmud says as follows. It says that when she came to plead with him, it was from another incident that happened. Some people say it happened much later, but there was another incident where um, Shmuel saw that they were looking for a Kohen to slaughter the offerings. And he said, he told people, you don't think that's not the law. You don't need to, that's not the law. The law is you don't need to go in there. Even, even a regular person can slaughter the animal. The Cohen's need it for other parts. So the students hear this and they say, wait a minute. If you, kid, and we don't know what age he is, this question is a little bit old, how old he is, but you, you know, you're deciding the law in front of your rabbi. Because Ellie is the decider of the law, and you're now telling everyone what to do. You're deciding the law. And the sentence that holds is a death penalty. Now, it's not killed in, 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 in the court of law, it's killed through the hand of Hashem. But, but um, some people, the Talmud learns this, that when at some point in Shemuel's career, he, he did this, and Eli wanted to have him punished. And Hannah came along and said, wait a minute, I'm the woman that, 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 that prayed for the... So he says, don't worry, don't worry, this, this, this one didn't come out so good here. <laughs> I'll pray for another, another one. She says, no, this is the one I prayed for. And she says, this is exactly the one, he's the one. And she convinces Ellie to, to not to punish him. He was just being young, he was just being, you know... But but <laughs> it's just fantastic. So that's what some of some of this tremendous depth was. It's either she's begging him the simple meaning, she's begging him, you know, to take to take this child and to raise him. Or well, the other meaning is she's and at some point later on, she's begging Ellie not to punish him because this child, even though he did something wrong now, he did something that that's a serious offense. This is the and Ellie's saying, but okay, so fine, so he's not the but there'll be some uh, I'll pray for you another kid. No, this is the one. Now, she has five children altogether. Okay? There's five children. Well, let's see what happens now. Questions, comments before we're now going to see, see her song. Okay? Questions, comments, thoughts.
Yeah. So far, so good. Time check. Time check. Okay. Now, Chan is going to go in now. So again, so we see this whole story. She can't have children. A unique prayer, and we're going to see because we, because we learn a lot from Chana's prayer, so we're going to just go in a prayer a second. She now offers another prayer. After the child is born, after she brings the child to Ellie, and he's safe, he's not going to be harmed, and he's under control, she now gives out a prayer. Okay? So let's just see the prayer a little bit. Okay? Hannah prayed and said, let me see him on page 2. 423? Four, I'm sorry, four, 423, mm -hmm. five lines to the bottom. Hannah prayed and said, now after this she prays again. Hannah is a great prayer. My heart exalted in Hashem, my pride was raised through Hashem. My mouth opened wide against my antagonists. For I rejoice in your salvation. There is none as holy as Hashem, for there is none beside you. And there is no rock like our God. I'm not getting into it now. It's a pretty philosophical thing she's explaining here. She's explaining, you know, uh, that God's involved in our lives, because people in the world wanted to say that God's too lofty, he doesn't care what we do. And she's saying, no, 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 that's not what's happening. God's involved in our lives completely. Okay? Do not abound in speaking arrogance by arrogance. Let not haughtiness come from your mouth. She's again saying, you don't understand. You don't understand God. She's going to praise here, for Hashem is the God of all thoughts, and deeds are counted by Him. The bow of the mighty is broken, while the flounder are girded with, with strength. God makes directs everything. Even though the philosopher said, how can it be two opposite things, the same thing, but God can do whatever he wants to do. The sated are hired out for bread while the hungry ones cease to be so. Okay? There, God directs the world in every single way that, that um, people who are one day they're rich, maybe the next day they're poor. <coughs> the poor become rich. While the barren woman bears seven, the one with many children becomes bereaved. Now, um, I want you to remember that line. It's part of Khanna's just talking about how Hashem directs the world completely. He's involved in the world in praising God. Remember that line when we come back to it in a second. Hashem brings death and gives life. Seemingly two opposites, but Hashem masters the world and attains them all. And he's involved. Lowers the pit and elevates. Lowers the haughty and raises up. Hashem poverty and makes rich. He humbles and exalts. He raises the need from the dust and the, trashes and the trash heaps he lifts the destitute. To seat them with noble and make them inherit a seat of honor. For Hashem are the pillars of the earth. And upon them he sets the world. He guards the people as devout ones. But the wicked are stilled in darkness. For not through strength does a man prevail. O oh Hashem. Now. Um, o oh Hashem. May those. Now. Those are the eight verses that starts with prayer in. Okay. Now, we learn a very interesting thing from this. The next verse is going to be her request to God. But what she does first is she gives verses of praising God, and then she asks the request. Isn't this how we learn about her davening before? Yeah. So this is a very interesting thing here, because this is she's showing us the form of davening. Whenever you daven, there's three parts in davening. There's, there's praise, that was the request, and then the thanks. Now, why do you need to praise God before you try to butter God up? What is that? What are you trying to do here? What is that? You can't butter God. What is that? Why? Suck what? out his often in a little bit. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like a kid to his dad. Like, dad, I love you so much. Can I get my box? Yeah, but that's that, that, that's that's a that's a dad. That's I mean, God just happens to your dad, but not not in that way. He doesn't, he doesn't get no, but I think you just acknowledges his his movement. Ah. You acknowledge his, his existence and the fact that he's controlling everything. So that's that's the deep root, not the butter up. Obviously, what's the reason we have? Because you're not praising God; he needs your praises. That's not what's happening here. But what are you doing? Is is by praising God? So what happens is is that um, you are acknowledging and understanding that he is really and truly the source of everything. And then you can ask him. But if you don't understand that, then you're saying, eh, you know, give me this. You know, uh, but you don't really believe he can do it because you don't understand that, that he is completely in control of everything. The praise is for us. The praise is for us to understand that, that everything is in his hands. 
And that's how I'm not going to go through it now, but it's a whole philosophy that the Malbim explains here, how she was answering the philosophers, what they were saying, how they got it wrong, and that, and that God's craft, when he creates something, it's different. See, the philosophers say, if you make an item and you need to go and to keep fixing it, that's not so good, right? If you build something, you build a dishwasher, and every week they call you to come fix it, it's no good. So how come God creates people and creates things they need to be fixed all the time? He needs to be involved. He didn't get it right the first time. You hear the question? The philosophers say? Right? If you create something, you create it like a dishwasher, and you have to come and fix it every week, then you didn't just do a good job. Mm-hmm. If God's involved in our lives, and he has to keep, we pray to him to fix this, make that, does that mean he didn't create it right the first time? So Chana says, you got it wrong, you don't understand. When a guy creates a dishwasher, he creates it and... <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Your analogy is really weird. No, it's, it's just dishwasher. the dishwasher doesn't My work, dishwasher's so broken. Yeah, yeah. okay. okay. Uh, I, mean, I don't think there were dishwashers in them days. Right, but the, the analogy. So, and my, mine's not working, so. Um, so, so if, if you go and you create a cool. pot, pottery, uh, a There's bird feeder, I don't know what, what I don't know what, a beehive. beehive, you create something, so you made it, it stands on its own. You're not, you're not, you don't, it, it's separate from you. But when God creates something, Hana says, what happens is, it doesn't stand on its own. It's only existing because God is constantly putting life into it. So you think now that it, 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 it wasn't right, now God's adding this. You got the whole thing wrong, Hannah says. God <coughs> is pumping existence into us every single second. In quantum physics, they found that, that they looked at the atom under the, uh, uh, the microscope. And see the subatomic particles. And what they see is they keep popping in and out of existence. That's what they say. That's what they write. It's like, it's like not there. It's like it's not there and it's there. And we, we say a verse in prayer every day. We say, God renews creation every second every day. We, when you live in the world that we live in and we see the table being here, it's always here. On the quantum physics level, it's not. Because the, the, the part the particles are not even there. They, they're gone into there, they're in and out. Well, how could that be? Physics can't understand that. We understand it. Because God is breathing life into creation every single second. It's not you create something and it's on its own. That's why we make something. When God makes it, it's, it's only existing because he makes it exist. Those are the points of Hannah saying. She's praising God. But when she praises God in this way and understands that he has complete mastery, then she makes a request. That's what we do when we pray. We have to say the praise first. And the Chana's request now is going to be, the commentary says, it's really basically, in a prophetic way, she's asking to guard Shmuel through the, tra- the challenges of his life. It she she refers to police, the Philistines, her Philistine, his Philistine story. She prays for him and, 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 and other issues that Shmuel has throughout his life when he anoints Saul and he anoints David. And that's really the last line here. It says, you know, and raise the pride of his anointed one. That, that when, when my son, Shmuel, is going to anoint the King David, that should last forever. And it does. So what she's doing is here, she's also showing us the form of prayer. Prayer is first is praise, but not because God needs our praise, because we need to say it. Once you have that, then you can make the request, and then afterwards you should thank, like Hannah did before, when she was like happy because she felt her prayer was answered. The prayer being answered doesn't always happen, though, so obviously. The very how much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes. Um. It's a very interesting story I want to share with you from Rav Palm. Palm, the Tzal, was a great rabbi. And what happened was, when he was an older man, one time he felt, felt dizzy, felt faint. And he, uh, he was about to fall down. And his wife took a fruit, an orange, and said, just take it, you need some sugar. And he took it, and he, and he started eating it. And it restored him, and he got his health. What? He was diabetic. 
but it was also, also 95 years old. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, uh, um, now, so our problem is now telling the story to his son afterwards. He says, I know what happened was I, I was really faint. My mother gave me an orange. And I, I, I took it and I, I wolfed it down. I never saw someone eat a fruit like that. Uh, it was embarrassing, but I, I, I had to like eat it fast. I was saying, wait a minute. I did see someone eating a fruit like that. I did. Years ago, it was 70 years ago, when I was in my 20s. He said, one time, he went to the hospital to visit somebody that was sick, a friend of his. And there was an old man on the bed next to him. And the friend had gotten this basket of fruit that you know, he brought. And what happened was a comment brought his own fruit also, and he saw this, this old man next to him looking at the fruit. <clears throat> and Rapam, who was a young man at the time, realized that maybe he's, he's hungry. And he couldn't talk. He must have been uh, struggling. He couldn't speak. And, you know, the hospital was kind of ignoring him. Mm -hmm. You know, that's we have to have good nurses here. That's how make sure they don't get ignored. So Rapam goes as the young man and, and gives the man, would you like an apple? And the man goes, he gives an, an orange. He gives the man an orange. And the man takes it and goes, <laughs> Wolves it down. And Pam said, at the time, I, I, I never saw someone eat something like that. I realized the guy had probably been dead and fed him in days. Mm -hmm. So he said, you know what? I, I, I thought about it at the time. I said, you know, that's a nice thing. He's a young man. a nice thing I did. You know? You know, I'm sure Shem is going to reward me at some point. And now I reward him 70 years later. 70 years later, he got his reward for the arm. When you pray something... Sometimes the prayer doesn't get answered even in your lifetime. Your great-grandchild may get that prayer. <laughs> because Hashem determines that it's not what you need right now. It doesn't mean it didn't, it didn't make its mark. A true prayer makes its mark. And so it may come out in a kid, a grandchild, a great-grandchild. You don't know. But it's going to come out in the right place. So Hannah, after she makes the request, she's, she's like when she leaves, she's totally content to say... You know, I believe it's, I'm thankful, I believe I should be answered. Those are the three parts of prayer we learned now, okay? The, the shevach, praise, <coughs> the request, and then after the request, then we have to really understand that thanks for Hashem for receiving the prayer. And however He decides to, to dole it out to us, and when He decides to dole it out to us, that's going to be for our best interest. Okay? So now let me say one last point here, and then we'll just, because I, I mentioned this thing about the seven kids. Look back here on 425. While the barren woman bears seven, the one with many children becomes bereaved. Now, here she's talking about just how life goes up and down based on how Hashem runs the world. But there is a prophetic um, reference that's happening here also. Because it's also referring to her relationship with now, she didn't mean it that way, but prophetically, this is what was also happening. Because Panina had ten kids. And every time Hannah had a child that was born, two. So if she has five, then all her children died. Right, right. So every time Panina has, every time Hannah has a child, and now I don't know if they saw it directly, because you'll see what happens, and I don't know when they picked up this was happening, but Hannah is a child born. And two of Pina's kids died. Mm. I don't know, they died the same day, within the same two, two years, I don't know how much time, but, but that, that's what happened. And again, unfortunately, again, Panina really, really beat Hannah, and she, and she browbeat her, she really, she really harassed her with <coughs> some, half good intentions and too hard and all that stuff we talked about. But Hannah has a child, two of Pina's died, she's got down to eight. I don't know if she realized it yet, but then Hannah has another child, and then two more Pina's died. Well, but this... Oh, hold on. Seven, seven, oh, okay. right. Hannah has, has a third child and two more, down to six. Hannah has another child, she has four kids, Panina two more died, Panina's down to two. And I don't know if this is the point where Panina realized what was going on, I don't know if she realized at this point, or if she was just willing to do, bite the bullet and do what she does now, but she comes and she begs Hannah, do something, do something here. Okay, so I don't know if Panina, like, now realize it's a direct correlation, or if she was willing to like get out of maybe something that she felt she didn't in a relationship, but she pleads with Hannah, 
you have to intercede and help me. And Hannah does. And Hannah, and Hannah gives another awesome prayer to Hashem, which is not recorded here, but she prays to Hashem to, to, to save Penina's kids. And that's why Hannah, when she has her fifth kid, Penina's two don't die. And that's why it says seven. Because the last two, Hannah had five that she gave birth to naturally, that she gave to. But in the end, there's the two others of Penina that are considered to be as if her kids because they were saved because of her, which mainly completes the whole cycle because the whole point Penina was brought in was to motivate Chana, and in the end, you know, Penina has two kids and Chana has, has five, but they're, they're all they're credited in a certain sense all to Chana. She, she saved those two kids also. Yeah. Other than Shmuel, does anything miraculous happen or out of the ordinary happen with Chana's children, is included? Um, to reflect, we don't, like the whole seven completion. Um, we don't, we don't, we don't hear it, and I don't, I don't know about it. But, um, but Panina, um, Panina, uh, um, you, you know, there's there's something. Um, maybe I just want to add to you about. We don't hear about the other other children, so I don't, I don't know, I don't know. But in 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 Hannah's prayer. She also says that God raises down to the depths and raises up. Morish all He brings down to the to the depths and he raises up. And there's another person that Hana is related to that I don't know if you ever realized that. She's related to someone named Korach. Korach, the one who started rebellion against Moshe, is her great great grandfather. And Hana's prayer of raising down to the depths. And bringing up is a prayer for Korach, her great grandfather, and he is he is you know it says that even though he was so bad he's going to be brought back and raised back up, and Hannah's prayer is part of that, and Shmuel is part of the way that that Korach is fixed up, and we have that concept when someone has children, grandchildren, they give merits to the, to the parents, so Shmuel and Hannah are the culmination. And the fixing up of Korah, who was a smart person, a great person who, who made a terrible mistake and ended up messing himself up and rebelling against Moshe, that's going to be fixed up through Chana and through Shmuel in, in this part also. Yeah. I hate it when in the Bible um, a person is, is uh, punished by uh, deaths, especially of children. Right. And why should the children be? Be, be killed just to punish somebody. So it's a very fa fair question. So generally speaking, and this you got to know this, and this is why it's an answer to your question in specific, but in general too. Whenever we say in the Torah a person is punished because of X, Y, and Z, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the only reason. Okay? For example, Aaron had four kids. Two of them died and says because of the sin of the golden calf. But if you read the text, it says clearly they died because they brought an offering into the temple they weren't supposed to bring. Well, which one is it? It is, yeah, both. It's, it is both. Because nobody dies, no person dies for sin that's not theirs. Okay? So what happened was, the sons had to die because of their own sin. They had their own sins that they did wrong. I'm saying that's the story of Aaron. Because we don't, oh, I'm saying the same principle. Aaron. Okay. But Aaron there, because he didn't have the merit to protect them, because very often certain people are, you're protected in certain cases even if you don't deserve it. So for example, if there's you help people, and you come to the Rosh Hashanah, and you don't merit on your own, but there's, there's an old lady you give $5 to every week, so why should she lose out? Because you're not a good person. So you can get saved to that old lady with you pay five dollars to every every week. So every time you do something, you create this intricate web of of interrelationships. So it's not no one's punished because something that, they, that, that someone else does. That's not possible. That's impossible. That's not possible. But what happens is, is that that people who do things, they're not even punished on their own thing. There are so many calculations, right? They're tremendous, and you have to understand that. It's not, it's, and that, that's, I, I'm glad you bring this up. It's never, it's never black and white. If somebody, especially when you take into consideration and understand that everything Hashem does is for our benefit. 
That means if someone is going to die now, one of previous kids, it's actually for their benefit at this point, right? They had done something. Penina had done something. But they had done something, and there was a reason why them leaving the world was better for them and for everything else. So we're not saying that's the only reason. That's what we're, we're talking about now in this context. Because we're not giving the class on Panina's kids and, and what the story was. But we're talking about what, what Panina had done wrong. Because, let me explain why again, even if her kids deserve to die, why should she deserve to be sad? See, that's what I'm saying. It's so interconnected that, that no one can have something happen to them that shouldn't happen to them. So the calculation of God's Judgment is so intricate that that you have to understand that it's it's to the it's to the hair's breadth, and that's what Tovar Rosh Hashanah. Rosh is understanding that the judgment is so precise that nobody gets something they're not supposed to get. I thought that we learned that the children weren't punished for the sins of their parents. That's right. That's what I said. So I said. So the answer is is that that whenever we see a child is punished because of the sins of the parents, means the child had their own sins that were causing that. It just means that in, this, in certain cases, the parent may have had a merit to protect the child that the parent doesn't have. Is that what I'm answering? Does that make sense? Do you understand that yeah, point or no? Doesn't Judaism, wouldn't Judaism necessarily not say that's a punishment? I mean, if you die? Right. It could not be. But, 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 but the point is, is that, is that you know, it, it's, a, it's obviously a, a, a sad thing and has to be understood why. There are cases where people die because they leave this world righteous instead of leaving the world when, when they would have been, stayed longer, they would have become bad people. So God calculated it was the best thing for them to go. But the, there's, as I'm saying, the intricate calculations, there's so many factors. We, 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 get, we, get a plan, we get a three part series on why, why rights people suffer at some point in one of these series. But, but there I talk to you about there's so many possible reasons why something happens. And each one is, shows that's exactly what has to be.